because the largesse of views goes gradually out of the window. Now, we found this kind of atmosphere in certain organizations that are not terrorist and therefore are, so to speak, more mainstream Islamic. And you know the organizations I'm, I'm referring to. And therefore, the question is, how could such organizations become so narrow in outlook and so selective in their approach to the beautiful religion of Islam? And there we run into a phenomenon. Islam had a long phase of decadence. And that phase of decadence began before colonization. My thesis is Islam did not become colonized, uh, decadent because it was colonized. It became colonized because it had become decadent. If it had not become decadent, it would have withstood militarily colonialism. But of course, colonialism made things much, much, much worse. And you cannot deny that the mentality of some of the people who support what we call Islamism or terrorism, it's not the same thing, do have that frame of mind that has to do with a constant struggle against colonization. Coloniza colonization in the imperialist way, as it was done, was a terrible wrong. When you go to Algeria or to Morocco, you will see that over every harbor in the most beautiful position, there is a cathedral de Notre Dame d'Afrique. Uh, the French army came with the first boat and the missionaries came with the second boat. When they came to Algiers, there were 300 mosques. When they left in 1962, and I was there when they left in 1962, eight mosques were left and the sun, the, the Juma mosques, the main mosque, had become a cathedral. You, can you imagine the rage that caused? And when you then see young people who say, yes, now we are independent, more or less politically, even though the American ambassador is telling us what to do, but economically, we are not so, in, so independent, and culturally, not at all. Such people will carry that rage against colonialism all the way to New York, even a hundred years after colonialism has stopped on paper. Now, Islam got out of that. Um, <laughs> I edited a German translation of the Quran, which was published first in 1901, under a pseudonym. And the German Orientalist professor who had made the translation in 1901 wrote in the introduction that Islam obviously is on its way out. Nobody would contradict him in 1901 because that's exactly how it looked. Now that Islam has not gone out but gone into a new vitality, a new renaissance and a new expansion, so to speak, worldwide, not only in the internet, is due to a number of great leaders 
who established what is called the Islamic movement. Al-Afghani, Hassan al-Banna, Said Qutb, Abu Ala al-Mawdudi, Abbasim Madani, Rashid Rida, Rashid al-Ranushi. Now the names may no, not tell you much, but the amazing thing is that except for one of two, all of the decisive leaders of the Islamic Renaissance were not people who had studied Islam, who were specialists of Quran and Sunnah, who were, so to speak, ulama. They were natural scientists. They were architects, school teachers, pedagogues, lawyers, above all, medical doctors. If you go to the United States, the incredible dynamics of Islam in the United States is mostly due to medical doctors. One out of five medical doctors in America is a Muslim by now. There is no other religious group which has such high a level of academic representation now, why did it happen that the decisive movements for the renaissance of Islam had leaders that were not Islamologues? It is because, as part of the decadence I have been speaking of, the ulema had been corrupted by entering too narrow a marriage with the rulers. But the outcome is that even today you find Islamic leaders who do not have the overall command of uh, um, Quran and Sunnah and therefore tend to be a bit more selectively to pick a verse here and pick a verse there, make it absolute and say, let's go. <clears throat> With that I have arrived at the present time in February in Bahrain. You will all admit that we are at a very critical stage. that the fate of terrorism in this world, the key to overcoming it, lies both in Tel Aviv and Washington. But that we are not so sure that these two powers will use that key. We know that the Islamic world is now in danger of being more split than before in those inside and those outside because the Muslims outside are now under more pressure than, than ever. And we know that there is a danger that the United States will go gang-ho com coming down like a ton of bricks like after Pearl Harbor with enormous patriotism and emotional commitment lashing out left and right. Uh, just as it had been done against the Sudan. Uh, I visited Khartoum and saw that one and only pharmaceutical factory of the Sudan, downtown Khartoum, which out of the blue, without any announcement or warning, was destroyed by six American cruise missiles, without any evidence before or after that anything wrong was done. The only explanation the Sudanese could find for that was Monika Lewinsky. And that's why they did not become anti-American. They said, cherchez la femme. But we are not in that situation anymore. We are in a, in a much worse situation where the United States is not only out to destroy a factory, 
it's out to change whole governments, to change whole educational systems, to, to reform the world, so to speak, in its image. I have, <coughs> all my life, I have been amazed, as somebody who knows the United States very well, and my, I have an American son, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and my first wife was American. Third boat in Massachusetts. I was amazed, and I continue to be amazed, how a nation that has had so many crimes committed during its past could be so optimistic about its leadership in the future. The only successful